Hey guys, thanks for tuning us in for this second episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. We've got a great lineup for this episode, including a couple of comedians, Carlos Mencia and Roy Wood Jr. We'll also be visiting with country music star Martina McBride and actor, director, and writer Peter Fashionelli. Well, first off, Carlos Mencia. He's going to be playing a gig at the Bricktown Comedy Club in Oklahoma City from September 3rd through the 6th. I've had several visits with him, and the latest one, while working remotely from the home studio in late April. Always great to visit, not only with a friend of the show, but uh, one of the greats, uh, one of my favorite comedians, Carlos Mencia on the line with us first off. And Carlos, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show. Dude, I appreciate it, bro. Having to get up early like a normal human being and <laughs> pretend that I have a job and do something with my life. Oh, I hate it when amazing. that happens. It's am- I actually got up and took a shower and put on clothes just to feel like like a normal human being for one day. <laughs> now, now, Carlos, you you've been staying busy even uh, even during the the slowdown time, if you will, doing uh, karaoke at home with the family. I mean, what, where did that first uh, spark an interest for you? You know what happened was um, I've been doing karaoke at home forever. I, I don't fancy myself somebody with a good voice, but you know, at, at times I can hit a note. And uh, what happened, the way it started was my brother came over the house and he started drinking Jameson right out the gate. So there was no like <laughs> beers. You know what I mean? It was like hard liquor from the beginning and I was drinking scotch. And then my son excuse me, said, hey, Dan, let's do karaoke. And and my brother said, dude, I dare, you, I dare you to do it on Instagram Live. And I said, fine, we'll do it on Instagram Live. I don't care. And then we did it, and people started, like, saying, hey, this is great. This is awesome. This is fun. And then, you know, on Instagram Live, one person at a time, somebody can request to be on at the same time as you. So somebody wanted to get in, and I was like, yeah, get him in. And then we talked, and I said, do you want to do a duet? And I think this uh, girl wanted to do uh, summer nights where they, you know, the guys and the girls, and we did it <laughs> over that. And it was, it, you know, it was a little off. The timing was a little weird, but it was really fun, and everybody had a good time. So uh, I, I, we've done it a couple of times, two or three times already. Um, yeah, it's uh, you look. You got to do whatever you can right. to to not let all this um, get you. And I think that you know, I think that the way you feel about this lockdown depends on if you know people who have suffered from it, gotten sick from it, or God forbid, passed away from it. And, you know, for for me, I know more than one person who's gotten it and uh, passed away from it. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a little more real than for normal people who are like, let's just get back to work and, you know, let's get back. You know, for me, it's like, hey, I, I know people that passed away. And I, and, I, and I know, I know, I know the numbers, you know what I mean? One percent. Of, of, of people in America it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, you know, three, 3.3 million people, even half a percent is one and a half million people. That's a lot of people to die if we, you know, put everybody back out there. But, uh, you know, we're trying to save lives, dude. And you know what? I think it's pretty cool. It I is. think it's pretty cool that in, a, that in an economy, that in a country driven by, you know, money, driven by, you know, the economics of competition, driven by, you know, all of that, that, we're literally staying home, not for money, but just so that, you know, people don't die. And some of the most vulnerable people, you know, our old people. It's kind of cool that as a society, we're not just saying, you know what, they're old, they lived, what are we going to do? That, you know, we're kind of respecting that life. I, I think that's uh, that's a beautiful thing. You know, it that depends is. on how you want to look at stuff. That's, that's how right. I look at it, right? That's right. Now, and, and Carlos, th- being a comedian, man, you've seen so many changes. And, and and like doing that karaoke bit that that went live on Instagram and blew up. I mean, it just kind of shows the way times have changed, haven't they? Well, yeah. And you know what's funny, right? So I have a 13 year old son who spends his time <laughs> normally, right, in normal times, on the phone with his friends. Never get him off. Always talking to his friends going on Xbox or PS3 and and PS whatever, the PlayStation and talking with his friends. And all of a sudden, about one week or so into our lockdown, 
you know, he was like, dude, it sucks, Dad. I go, what sucks? <laughs> I can't, I can't like talk to my friends. I go, dude, you talk to him on the phone all the time. He's like, I know, Dad, but it's different. There's no human connection. And I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> All you ever do is spend time on the phone with your friends. I've literally seen him and his friends sitting in a circle texting each other. And I'm like, and now <laughs> it's about the connection? Wow, this is crazy. But, you know, it, it's it's like, it's it's a trip, man, because, you know, th this is changing everything, you know. And and look, at the end of the day, I think what, what, what we're realizing is that we're social beings and we need we need each other. I think as a stand-up comedian, I'm just trying to figure out like, how can I do how can I do a stand-up you know some stand-up for people where it doesn't look awkward. Right. The thing about you know now I think more than anything, I was talking to my friend the other day and I go, I go now you realize why they added laugh tracks to old sitcoms or to the Flintstones, and and he goes yeah because I don't I, I don't know if you've been watching comedians do their jobs. But when right now we tell a joke and we know that it's funny and we know that people at home are laughing, but there's no laugh track, there's nobody. So it just looks like there's a weird pause <laughs> at the end of the joke and silence. And does it look awkward to you? It, as a comedian, it looks awkward to me because I know why that pause is there. I go, I know, I know people are laughing at home, but it looks weird because there's nobody laughing where you are. It's so bizarre, dude. It's all. It's almost. It's almost like. It's almost like watching. You know, uh, the, the, it, it's like a silent movie. I just. I can't. It's. It's so bizarre, dude. It's so bizarre. Now, so what's... I'm trying to figure out how how can I do that, but get laughter in there with real people, you know, so that I don't. Uh, so so check this out. Uh, I I I remembered that my son my my son my uh, nephew goes to school in St. Louis Obispo and they have a drive-in theater not far from there and I remember driving by it so I called the other day and I was like hey what how much would you charge me to rent it and do you have a digital projector and they go yeah we do so I'm thinking that if this thing goes too long I might actually do a concert at a drive-in theater I'll do a stage they'll project me onto the big screen behind me and everybody can stay in their cars and socially distance and they can open their windows or they can sit on the hood of their cars and I can actually hear them laugh. And it'll be like, you know, it'll, it'll be a little, a little more normal than just doing jokes for nobody. And, uh, and that's one, something we're all having to do is, is make a changes, you know, uh, do, social distancing. And, uh, of course you got the podcast, got the website, uh, the karaoke with the family as well. And Carlos always want to make sure and let folks know where they can keep up with all the things you got going on. Yeah, just go to carlosmencia.com uh, or my my handles on my social media are at Carlos Mencia. And I think uh, Friday we do karaoke. And then Saturday, believe it or not, I do this thing where I pretend I'm a DJ from the 1970s <laughs> and I take requests. I don't spin, right? I don't spin. Like, I don't have turntables. I just, people will say, hey, why don't you play the Eagles so-and-so for me, for my girlfriend, Monica? And I'll be like an old school DJ going, this next one goes up. <laughs> Kevin from Monica, here you are. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like Casey Kasem from back in the day. <laughs> and I did it the other day just as a goof. And people started like coming in and doing it. And, and, and it was it was really fun, man. And so we're just trying to find ways to connect as human beings. You know what I mean? Because I've been in lockdown since March 5th, I think it wow. is now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's to the point where, you know, the, even the people that I love are getting annoying. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like, it's like, we're, it's like we're toward the end of uh, monopoly. You know what I mean? And it's like, really, you're going to charge me rent grandma. You know what I mean? We're playing, we're playing Pictionary dude. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, you know, and I'm embarrassing people like, does, does this look like a palm tree to anybody here? You know what I mean? <laughs> My wife the other day literally goes, are you breathing while you chew? I'm like, wow, it's getting bad. Am I breathing? Yeah, I'm not dead. Yeah. Yeah, I am breathing. I'm not dead yet. It's getting rough, bro. It's getting rough. Well, that's funny. And uh, Carlos, again, great to visit with you. Check him out on his website, carlosmencia.com. Uh, stay safe, and uh, hopefully we'll look forward to talking to you again real soon, my friend. I appreciate it, man. Be well. Stay safe. 
Again, Carlos will be at the Breakdown Comedy Club in Oklahoma City, September 3rd through 6th. For more information, visit his website for ticket information and social media handles as well. Next up, I had the chance to visit with the legendary country female vocalist Martina McBride about her latest single and the process of recording and marketing in the midst of this pandemic. Privileged and honored to have a chance to visit with one of my favorites, Martina McBride. And first off, Martina, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, now, Martina, the, the the new single out, and obviously uh, p- putting a single out and uh, the marketing and all that, right now, w- would you say it's just slightly different than anything you've ever encountered before? Yeah. I mean, everything in our lives is different than anything we've ever encountered before, for sure. But yeah, <clears throat> you know, recording this song, I, I just got the song and, and um, got home to Nashville, and that was my producer, went over to his house and played it for him the demo and we decided what to do with it in the studio and then then about two days later we went into lockdown so luckily excuse me luckily he can play every instrument under the sun so he played all the instruments and sang from his home studio and i was able to go to uh, my husband and i own blackbird studio in nashville so it was closed down to the public but um i was able to go down there and with my just my engineer isolated and socially distanced and record my vocals and so we never really had you know musicians in the studio like we normally do and that was definitely sorry i've got a noisy bird can you hear my bird i can that's (laughs) that's that's ambiance is what that is yeah i walked outside this bird is angry i don't know what the problem is but it's not happy now the new single "Girls Like Me" for you was it was it maybe a little bit refreshing, changing things up? Did it did it maybe light a fire that uh, it lightened a little bit, if you will? Um, you mean the way we re- recorded it or the song itself? Yeah, the way you recorded, having to do everything's different. Did did it maybe bring it out a, a little bit more to you? Yeah, I mean, it made me appreciate you know being in a studio with musicians. I I missed that really because. Part of making a record is the camaraderie between the musicians and and um, you know the creative process of being able to change things on the fly and try new things. But it, it was definitely very focused. You know, we 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 got in there and got it done. And um, I was just excited about recording this song because I, I just love the song so much and and I feel like it's such a great message and. Um, so I was just excited to to record it, no matter how we had to get it done, you know. And, and to to have your your music out there, especially when everybody's going through these hard times, and and maybe be a, a bit of an inspiration to to others. For for you personally, uh, what what does that mean to you on the personal side? Yeah, well, you know, the song talks about the fact that we all go through insecurities, we all make mistakes, we all life is messy. It's not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. And it's going to be okay, you know, and I, I feel like that's just such a hopeful message. And right now, you know, to hear in a song that not only um, are you going to be okay, but somebody understands what you're going through, too, you know, and we're all going through this whole thing together. I mean, it's really w- one of the first times I can imagine maybe 9-11 is the other one where this country is going through a common experience, you know, we're all going through this together at the same time, and and it's affected all of our lives, and we talk about it a lot because that's you know it 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 is it is invaded and uh, affected every part of our lives. So, um, being able to be able to create a piece of music that is hopeful um, and a song that I really love during this time has just been definitely helpful for me um, to be able to focus on something like that. Now, for you, what is what is maybe the, the, the best thing that you've learned from this quarantine uh, being a part-time uh, that, that maybe you, you are looking to, to maybe implement a little bit more once things get back to whatever that new normal is? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I've learned, you know, I've learned that I, 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 honestly, I'm kind of a, the per, a person that's okay with solitude and quiet. So that hasn't, that hasn't been that challenging for me. It's been more challenging for my husband. Who is a, who's kind of an on-the-go guy, but um, I'm always kind of at home when I'm off the road anyway. I think the biggest challenge for me has been not being able to tour and not being able to see the fans and be, sing on stage live, especially with this new song. But it's also made me realize that, well, how much I miss it, obviously, um, 
But that, you know, you just have to get creative about ways in which to reach, to, to connect with your fans and to, to connect with your friends and other people. You know, it's just been a challenge to stay connected. And I think that we, we've all realized, I think, you know, in some way we've all realized what we really need um, from this pandemic, you know, what we need to move forward and finding, finding the strength, whether it's being okay with being alone and quiet or trying to figure out a way to connect with people because that's what you need, you know. It's just been a big lesson. That's for sure. And again, the the new single is is Girls Like Me and uh, Martina. Of course, we've been uh, we've been playing it here. Want to make sure and let folks know where they can find out more information, not only about the single, everything you've got going on, and uh, hopefully one of these days tour dates be updated as well. Yeah, well, I have a website martinamcbride dot com. Um, I also have you know I've written two cookbooks, which I've cooked out of incessantly during this quarantine. So um, we have some autographed ones up there for sale, and. I also am on Instagram, which is my favorite uh, platform of social media. So that's where I actually put the most information. So it's very visual. You know, you get to post videos and, of what you're doing and, and um, pictures and stuff like that. So it's just Martina McBride on Instagram. So if anybody wants to follow me on Instagram, I post pictures of what I'm cooking for supper and my dog and <laughs> a glass of wine, <laughs> you know. So it's real personal, which I really love to be able to share. All right. Well, uh, again, Martina McBride, it has been a true privilege to have the chance to visit with you. Wish you nothing but the best, and uh, hopefully we can catch up. I'd, l- I'd love to talk some cookbook with you someday. Oh, that'd be great. I'd love that. Well, Martina, again, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you for having me. Take care. Of course, you can always find out more about all her latest music, tour dates, all of that on martinamcbride.com. Our next guest is a stand-up comedian and correspondent on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. We'll visit about the Democratic and Republican National Convention coverage each weeknight that takes place through next week's Friday episode. Roy Wood on the line with us, and and Roy, good to visit with you again, my friend. Hey, how y'all doing, man? Doing well. It's uh, Obviously, we're all trying to figure out what the new normal is, and uh, man, speaking of the new normal, the, the 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 Daily Show with Trevor Noah. You guys are are doing five nights uh, during this week and uh, and next week covering those conventions. And uh, uh, d- first off, Roy, what's uh, what has been your impression so far this week of the DNC? It's been very very odd in places. Like it was, they had this music number where Billy Porter was on a green screen, and it, like that was. Very different and, and, and uninteresting. I really love Michelle Obama's speech. Like people have to understand. Like if you don't really follow the pol- if you don't follow politics, the conventions are essentially Coachella. It's like Super Bowl week meets Coachella. It, it's it's all of your favorite politicians all speaking on the same stage in a week long celebration of whatever it is they believe in. Okay, fine, but sprinkled in between every professional politician. Is an open micer who shouldn't be on the dang microphone. And that's the thing that I love. Imagine Coachella if karaoke happened every 20 minutes. Where there's a great, oh, and now Beyonce, and now Sheryl Crow, and now the dude from the tire shop donated enough money to somebody's political campaign to be invited. Come on up here, dude who owns tire shop. So, so it's a lot of that, man. So we're just we're cracking jokes on both sides of the aisle, and you know, at the end of the day, it's just about getting people activated for November. So you know, whatever you believe in, take it to the polls in November, and you know, we're just trying to just highlight some of the issues. And if there's some inconsistencies and contradictions in there, then there's probably some jokes. So that's what we're out to do. Now, now, how hard is it, Roy? For is it hard to stay to to, to stay neutral, if you will, in, in covering uh, politics? Is is it hard to keep your your own personal side out of it as well? Yeah, I think that you know, and you know, if we're going to speak honestly, you know, the Daily Show takes a lot of flack for being, you know, oh well, they only a, they lean liberal. Okay, well, if you the way I look at it is this. Uh, government is a car. The president drives the car. Every four years, we elect a new driver. So whoever the driver is is going to get some flack about which way they're driving the car. That's standard issue. So it's hard to be two-sided in that regard, you know, on a regular basis. Of course, 
the Democrats are in the backseat, backseat driving the president. So there's jokes to be had. But ultimately, right now, as it stands right now, they are in the backseat. So of course, they're going to see a different set of jokes and be held to a different level of responsibility. And so I think that changes out. But I think ultimately the goal of The Daily Show has always been to not criticize the president. It's to criticize the car. And how do we fix the car? How do we make this a better car? And that involves more people than the president. The president isn't the be-all, end-all of making this country a better place. And that's why I love, you know, the role of that correspondence play. It's Trevor's job to talk about all that national stuff. <laughs> it's the job of the correspondent. It's the job of the correspondent to put a face to the issue, to put something local to the issue, to show you people affected by the issue. And ultimately, that's what really matters in the long run. And, and as a as a correspondent, uh, how cool is it for you to be out there on the front lines and to see things firsthand? Uh, it's cool, but during COVID, it's dangerous. So I'm staying at home. I'm not going to bring that cough home to my kids. <laughs> what, like it's, what, what has been the, the the biggest challenge in this COVID thing? You, you know, with uh, obviously on the Daily Show doing stand up. I mean, h- how much has this had to change your your day to day activities? Uh, just just your regular schedule. Well, just being home on a regular schedule, I've had to learn how to schedule around my child's schedule. Um, like I literally wake up every day, and it's not about what do I need to do. It's what does my child have to do today, yeah. and then I start from that place, and then from there. I can plan my day out around this. Like literally the moment we hang up the phone, it's time to get him set and make sure that the e-learning is set up so that he doesn't not know how to read. He's four, so I don't even know if it's time to read, but I've just preemptively started him on reading. And that's like probably been the biggest adjustment for me during quarantine and, you know, just during this pandemic has been figuring out how to be an at-home school teacher and lesson plan. God bless teachers. They literally have to lay, like when you think about it like football, you have to have a plan of attack for this classroom for the entire school year. I can't even plan out two days in a row with my son. I'm like, okay, today we're going to write. Tomorrow we're going to do Play-Doh. And then the next day, uh, what do you say we learned about tectonic plates and volcanic eruption? That sounds like fun, right? That's that's a four year level I don't know right there. Four year olds should know about it, but my son does. If you have questions about seismic activity, he can set you straight. Now, but he the, cannot count to one hundred. That's that's good. Now, Roy, the, the the DNC going on this week. Uh, how do you have to change your mentality or uh, to to get ready and prepare for the GOP? Obviously, a, a whole different ball game next week. I think the the thing that I love about the conventions for the Daily Show is that you know. We spend time outside of convention season looking for stories and tracking stories and figuring out what's going to be the best, what's the best meal to assemble for our viewers for that night. Whereas during convention time, we don't have to answer that question. We already know what the food's going to be. It's basically a buffet of opinion. So we're just deciding, we're just picking from which ones to decide, okay, here's of what happened last night. Here's what's most significant to the national conversation that we're already having. Here are things that are crazy and silly and ridiculous. So it's a lot easier to plan the show because you're just kind of you're just reacting to things that are already been, that have already been said. That's right. Now uh, you know, you're reacting to the conversation instead of we're outside of the convention. The job of the Daily Show, in a lot of ways, is to help create the conversation around an issue. That's right. And again, uh, five days of uh, of the Daily Show with uh, Trevor Noah this week and uh, next week. And Roy, I always want to make sure and let all of our listeners know where they can keep up with uh, everything you've got going on social media. And I know there's going to be some tour dates sometime coming up. Yeah, we're, we're looking for October, November. You know, we're just monitoring all the local ordinances. Because the problem is that some comedy clubs are opening up and then closing right back up again. You know, they see a spike in their county. Uh, so we're waiting to see, but you know, the name is Roy Wood Jr. Put an at sign in front of it or a dot com behind it, and that's me everywhere. <laughs> there you go. Well, Roy, always good to visit with you, my friend. Uh, looking forward to more coverage uh, throughout the convention season, and hopefully we can catch up again real soon, my friend. Okay, sounds good. And our final guest of this episode is Peter Fascinelli. You know, you've seen him on the big screen, the small screen, and such titles as Twilight, Nurse Jackie, and Fast Times. 
Peter's releasing his sophomore directorial feature film that is available this Friday, August 21st, entitled Vanished. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show again. Oh, I'm so excited to be back on. Thanks for having me. Now, we're about to talk, uh, got a second directorial feature coming out, uh, available tomorrow, called The Vanished. And uh, Peter, for you, the, how much did you learn from the from the first feature that you used in uh, in feature number two, if you will? Well, I guess that's for the audience to, <laughs> to judge, huh? judge me at, but um, I hope I learned something. Uh, you know, this one's really special to me because I wrote it as well. The first movie I directed, I had such a good time on, but it, I didn't write that one. Uh, so this one I wrote and directed, so it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a personal piece for me. Um, it's about two parents who go to this RV park, and, and within the first 10 minutes, their daughter goes missing. And uh, the rest of the movie is kind of this who done it, uh, who took the kid. And, and so it's fun for the audience because they get to kind of uh, figure out the case and, and try to crack the case along alongside the parents who were trying to figure it out, too. Played by Thomas, Jane, and Anne Heche, uh, who did a fantastic job. Um, and when I was, when I was yo- younger, I had, when my daughter was younger, I had an RV. I used to take her on these trips. And I remember going to an RV park, and I went to go pay at the front desk, and there were some gunshots. I turned to him and I said, what was that? He said, oh, don't, don't worry about that. It's a, it's a prison a couple of miles down the road. They do drills once in a while. So if you hear two or three gunshots, it's fine. If you hear anything more, though, come run into the front desk. <laughs> so I didn't sleep all night. And uh, and then I started thinking, well, what would happen if there was a convict on the loose? And what would happen if my daughter went missing? You know, what would happen? How would I find her? And who would help me? It'd be like looking for a needle in a haystack out here in the middle of these woods. And so that kind of started the seeds, uh, planting the seeds to this movie, because it really is like every parent's worst nightmare is the thought of losing your kid, you know. Now, did you did you find it easier to stay on on course uh, as on directorial side of things, seeing that it that you're kind of working on the the image that is already in your head? Did it, did that make it maybe a, a little easier for you? Uh, maybe when you're right, when you're a writer and directing it, you're more connected to it. But you also, you know, don't have anybody else to collaborate with. So there's nobody to tell you, like, hey, you should try changing these lines or, you know, you should try changing that. You just got to hope that it works. And, and then, I, but I had really great actors, Thomas Jane, Anna Hayes, Jason Patrick, and they came in and they just lifted it and made it their own and really did a wonderful job. And, and I was really excited to collaborate with them. I love actors. You know, I'm, one, I'm an actor myself, so I know how hard it is to be in front of that camera you know, pouring your soul onto the, uh, onto the film, and, and so uh, it was fun to work with them. Now, the, it made its debut at the, the Mammoth Festival, the Mammoth Film Festival, and, and got a festival favorite award. Does that, was the feeling a little, is, is the feeling a little different when you get the accolades, when it, when it was uh, your vision, your dream, and, and then to see it come through on in fruition? I mean, you always uh, hope that people like it, and, uh, and it was nice to get an award, you know, it's Mammoth Film Festival, we won uh, its uh, festival favorite and also best score we won. But now it's, you know, we give it over to the audience and, and uh, it's art. So, you know, it's it literally like somebody might like it over here and somebody might not like it over there. So you give it away to an audience and you hope that they like it. But, uh, but we've gotten a good response so far and, I, and I, I feel like it's a movie that I would go see and watch and, and, and it'd be fun to to go uh, check out, so I, I hope people go see it. And Peter, extra how much points do uh, to, to anybody who figures out who took the kid? You get extra points. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I haven't had anybody figure that out yet. Yeah, now, now, Peter, with it, with everything that's going on, so much is being released on demand. So, does that mean that uh, at twelve o'clock tonight you'll be uh, perusing the social media to try to see what the feedback is, or how do you do on that uh, as far as feedback's concerned? Um, I guess. You wait till the weekend's over and you see how much you know people tuned in to watch it. I mean, we're we're playing in some limits, some theaters too. It just uh, depends on on, on where because we were in like thirty theaters, uh, but I know that there's there's a lot of theaters closed, so we're doing same day uh, video on demand, so you can get it on iTunes, uh, you get it on Amazon Prime, wherever you rent a movie at home, you can check it out. And I'm personally like I'm. I'm always looking for new stuff because 
I've been in quarantine for so long, I, I think I've finished all of Netflix. So uh, last weekend, I was like, there's no new movies out. What's going on? So I'm excited that my movie's coming out this weekend. All right, again, uh, available in uh, limited theatrical release, also on demand, available tomorrow, The Vanished. And Peter, always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with uh, more information about the movie and uh, everything else you got going on social media-wise as well. Uh, at Peter Faccinelli on Instagram and, and Twitter, same same handle. All right, well, Peter, always great to visit with you, sir. Looking forward to uh, to checking out the movie myself, and uh, and I'll text you if I if I figure out who the who 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 was the uh, the culprit. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like that. Uh, make sure you let me know. Peter, have a great weekend, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, or anything else you'd like to know, I'm on Instagram at aka underscore Cameron, on Twitter at Cameron Dole, on my Facebook page at Cameron Dole Altus. You can also email me, Cameron at KWHW.com. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, feel free to click the support tab and follow the instructions. We'll see you soon for episode three.